Um, what you've heard so far is obviously had the, um, the clinical aspects of IBS from Adam and also the, uh, the dietary. And, but you can already see there's a massive overlap between the two. But most of the patients that come to see us at the Functional Gut Clinic have already um, been through this process. We're very much is what we call tertiary. So you've tried your lifestyle measures, you've had some interventions, uh, and you're still looking for some answers. And I'm kind of the geek in the process of, of trying to understand the science behind it. So all of the things that Megan and Adam have been um, going through uh, and, and talking about, then it's our job as clinical scientists to try and provide some objective evidence of what is actually going on. And also use that objective evidence to look at uh, treatment effects and try and target treatment better. Okay? So I'm a clinical scientist, um, and it's a speciality that isn't really well known, but Clinical scientists are responsible for about 70% of the diagnostic tests that occur in, in the NHS. And that could be audiology, it could be respiratory, it could be cardiology. So we're a kind of silent geek world that uh, exists within healthcare. So the Functional Gut Clinic, um, just to go over who we are, um, IQIPS is an accreditation process which is incredibly arduous to go through uh, and ensures that all of our protocols and processes are at the highest level. So we get inspected every year. Uh, independently, people spend three days say, looking at what we do, our policies and procedures, and that allows us to, to improve everything that we do. So we're under a high level of scrutiny, and we're the only people who've reached that standard within uh, the ind independent sector in the UK, and there's only three centres within the NHS that have done that. So you're in good hands if you come here. Um, and it's a, a clinical scientist-led service, so HCPC is the Healthcare Professions Council, and just like dietitians are registered with that process. Uh, so with a clinical scientist. And again, it just keeps you assured that the people you're seeing are under scrutiny, are, are keeping their professional standards up, and have reached a high level of attainment. Um, you know, the clinic is equipped with state-of-the-art diagnostic equipment. The breath test that some of you are doing today, we use state-of-the-art gas chromatography, which is like the most sensitive way of looking at these gases. Um, and so we're always looking at equipment and, and techniques to try and keep it at the forefront. We have an active research program so we can bring things into the clinic when they're validated. And our idea is really to use this information to decode gut health, you know, to use a science-led, evidence-based approach to try and find out what's going on in each and individ you know, every individual that comes into the clinic. And what we're trying to do as a team is we're helping patients to take control of their gut health. So by the time people come and see us, they've tried lots and lots of things and seen lots of people, but we're just trying to take it that extra level that not everyone needs, but is essential for, for some people to meet some kind of resolution. And the algorithm that we use is our diagnostic development pathway. So we have patients coming into the clinic with symptoms, and what we try and examine is their physiology, so how everything's working, the function of the gut, so what the gut is actually doing, and patient's behaviour, because sometimes patient's behaviour really influences what, uh, what goes on. That usually, and hopefully, allows us to come up with an accurate diagnosis, which then helps our clinicians and dietitians have an effective treatment. But the important thing here is that all of that information feeds back. The outcomes feeds back into the algorithm, so we learn from it, realise which approaches do work and don't, and then constantly try and improve. And that's really important with new technology. You've talked about stool testing and leaky gut testing. These things have not gone through that process, and we're hoping to change that. Um, and it, you know, the vast majority of colonoscopies in IBS are normal, but there's all these other things that might be happening. So if you are going to do these tests, you need to make sure you're doing them properly. So this is just to go back uh, to my sort of uh, academic days um, to show some of the things that Megan was talking about and Adam, is that one of the first questions we wanted to answer was, can you actually pick up brain activity when you stimulate the gut? Is the big brain doing anything when you do it? And we've been able to do this, uh, this is going back 15 years now, looking at magnetic information, looking at blood flow changes within the brain, and we can stimulate different parts of the gut. And this was the first evidence, really, to show that the big brain was contributing to gut sensations. Up until this point, then, people were unsure of whether it was all uh, happening below that level. And what we're also able to do is to stimulate different parts of the gut and look at the sequence of activation and the intensity of activation. So we could develop new scientific tools that would say, can we stimulate um, control subjects and patients, and, and how does the brain process things differently? And I'm not going to dwell on this information too much. It's just to show that we've, we've gone through this process. And this was in IBS patients, and you can see it was 2011 when we published this. If we stimulate the rectum with an electrical pulse, you can get this nice brain wave in control subjects. And what you look at, so this is, this is going from 
the bottom upwards to the brain. But here, if you look at anxiety ratings on day one versus day two, on day one, even healthy control subjects are unsurprisingly anxious about having their rectum stimulated. But by day two, they don't really mind as much. Their brain switched off a bit, and, um, but we still get the same kind of, uh, of response from the bottom up. So you've got the top-down, bottom-up thing that we've talked about a lot. Just at the bottom here, we do have a group of patients that what we call nerve sensitization. So you can see that the pain threshold here is 27 and 25 compared to controls, which is 73 and 71. So much more sensitive, but you get the same <laughs> response. So um, some people with IDS are actually do have sensitization of gut nerves caused by some kind of process. And this is what we were trying to do with these, these studies to show that even though um, there's, there's a homogeneity to a certain aspect of IBS, you can differentiate people. Some people are actually hypersensitive and may need to be treated with the medicines that Adam talked about that reduce pain sensitivity. But we also had a group of patients that were hypersensitive here, but we got a very flat blame brain response. And they remained even more anxious on day two than they were on day one. Um, and these are the group of patients where the signal arriving in the brain is normal but actually they over-report it. So this is more of a top-down sensitivity. So separating that out gave us these concepts that you, you've got a, a group of people who process things normally, but you've also got a top-down, bottom-up differentiation. And we do have some methods for treating and differentiating that. So the question for me really was, was there a unifying hypothesis? And I'm not sure this is a unifying factor, but stress seems to affect all of these systems. And stress can be a top-down psychological um, process from uh, you know, external factors. We've got bereavement or exams or public speaking or, or all sorts of different things. Um, and that makes people worried and that switches the amplifier in your brain to allow more signals through and that makes you sensitive. But you also have stress that comes from the bottom up. And this can be where some of the dietary and the, the sensitivity of the bowel things come in. So you're getting more signaling from the gut and there is a problem down there. And, and that can be treated in a slightly different way. So the key for us in the clinic is can we look at this as an integrated factor? And you know, this is why our logo is a gut and a brain. You know, we came up with this because my whole sort of research career was looking at these brain-gut interactions. So we don't ignore one or the other, it's all integrated. And you know, we established the clinic in 2013, so we've been here now for about five or six years. And we solely focus on these issues. We don't do anything else. We're looking at these brain-gut interactions and trying to figure out what's going on. So we have moved on really from, from the brain imaging aspect of things because they're more research tools to trying to be a bit more pragmatic about how we can understand what's going on and help Adam and, and Megan to make some decisions. And you know, part of my interest is around the stomach and the reflux, which you, you spoke about before. Uh, you know, it's a very interesting area. Uh, of, of research for us, particularly how some of the drugs that you use to treat reflux may also exacerbate the symptoms of your IBS, which we'll talk about. But you can see this area that Megan talked about here, which is the first part of the colon, looks a bit like a stomach. That looks a bit like an esophagus. This is the small bowel. And I conceptually see that bottom part of the bowel to be a bit like um, a, a stomach and a, and a reflux organ of the lower bowel. And that's why a lot of symptoms can occur there as well. And the tests that we have developed um, help us look at that. So we're looking at transit, how things go through, motility, how things contract, digestion, how well you absorb things, fermentation, what are the bugs doing, and evacuation, how well things are, are being expelled. So the test that some of you are doing today, the hydrogen methane breath test, the principle is that for the test we're doing today, we've given you a sugar that you can't digest naturally. It should just pass through the bowel and be fermented in the large bowel. Um, if you do have bacteria in the small bowel, they'll start to ferment the, the sugar before you've had a chance to um, get it into the large bowel, and that's what can create symptoms. And that's a process which is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. But also, Megan talked about not, not producing more gas. Some people do produce more gas. So when we do our breath test, once the sugar goes into the colon, we get huge amounts of gas produced, and that can cause sensitivity as well uh, globally, and I'll try and explain that for you. So what you're doing today um, is drinking something, the sugar's being fermented, gas is being produced, it passes into the bloodstream, and then is excreted through your breath in your lungs. And that's what we're collecting in those test tubes. And that tells us about what the bacteria is doing and where it is. So the collection kits that we've used, these can be done at home, which is a great comfort to many patients who um, you know, don't want to travel, uh, you know, want to do it at a time that's convenient for them. 
uh, and can do, you know, have everything contained. People do come to the clinic as well, like you've done today, but, um, you know, people can make a choice. So it's a test tube kit. It can be done at home and clinic. The samples are valid for 14 days. We use a very sensitive way of measuring it. We can use lactulose or a simple sugar glucose for looking at SIBO. Um, and this gives us detailed assessment of gases. We also look at symptoms, importantly, because we try and provoke symptoms in the bowel to see if the changes that we see are relevant to the patient. So if you had a slightly abnormal response and had no symptoms, it's probably normal. If you've got a, a borderline response and you re reproduce all of your symptoms, then it's more likely to be clinically relevant. And Adam Mano uses that kind of information to make a decision on whether to treat or not. We can also use lactose or fructose or even other carbohydrates as well. Um, if, if you're particularly sensitive to something like mushrooms that have mannitol in, you can actually do a test for that as well. But they're less, less common. And importantly, these processes are now compliant with US and UK guidelines. So uh, there are internet available tests that you can buy online, but they're not compliant with the, the guidelines uh, and uh, they're not as robustly controlled. So uh, you know, just be careful if you are ordering those tests. So what can it be used for? Well, we can assess bacterial overgrowth. So that's too much bacteria in your small bowel, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Carbohydrate malabsorption, so are you digesting carbohydrates properly? Fermentation in the colon, if when things get into the colon, are they excessively fermented, like lactose, for instance? And hydrogen and methane can be seen as, and this is important, a functional consequence of what the microbiota is doing. When you do a stool test, it tells you what your microbiota looks like. It doesn't tell you what it's doing. But these tests, very crudely, look at some functional aspects of what that microbiota is doing and how it might be contributing to your symptoms. And again, I'll come back to this. We see this as a provocation test for the bowel. So we're not just passively looking at bowel function. We're trying to provoke something and see about that top-down, bottom-up relationship. And again, methodology interpretation up until recently has been varied widely across the UK. But Adam and I have worked with uh, some of the national bodies and we've come up with some national guidelines now that we're, the whole UK should be following. So this is what a, a normal breath test looks like. You can see here that we've got uh, the gas levels going up here in blue, and then we're tracking symptoms over time. And we have detailed analysis of the different values here. And hydrogen and methane, we'll talk about methane a little bit. Methane is a gas that's more related to constipation and slowing bowel transit, uh, where hydrogen isn't. So we've now published the guidelines for how to perform hydrogen and methane breath testing, so we're pretty confident we're doing it in the best way. Uh, Adam and I are, are leading on this document. And it really ensures that the breath testing, when people talk about doing a meta-analysis, if the studies that you put into a meta-analysis are poor and not well controlled, then you'll just get a reflection of that. What Megan showed with the FODMAP diet uh, meta-analysis, they only put in there good quality studies with a large number of patients with dietitian led studies. So we've not really been able to do a proper meta-analysis of breath testing because everybody's done it differently. And what we're hoping is now that everyone will do it the same way and then we will get some much better data. Um, so bacterial overgrowth, this is just to try and explain to you why um, you would get symptoms if you have too much bacteria. So what you can see here is if you have easily digestible food, it all gets absorbed before it gets down to the colon. And the colon is where all this fermentation normally occurs. But if you have high FODMAP foods or high fiber foods, then the polydigestible things some of it will get into the colon and you will produce some gas. And that's what Megan was talking about, about normal gas production. Um, the problem occurs if you have bacterial overgrowth and too much bacteria comes up into the small bowel, then even the easily digestible food starts to get fermented before you've had a chance to absorb it. So things that should happen in your large bowel happen in your small bowel, and that's painful. Uh, you know, it can make you feel nauseous, can give you cramping, can affect bowel habit. And then it's even worse than if you have the high FODMAP foods, because not only did they get fermented excessively in the colon, but you also get some of that fermentation happening in the small bowel. So it's a double whammy, if you like. And that's why sometimes people with SIBO will feel worse if they're taking prebiotics or fiber, because they could just get an excessive fermentation. And this process leads to what they call a putrefactive breakdown of, of products of digestion. And putrefaction, if you imagine that's, that's like rotting, essentially, of food, in your small bowel, and your small bowel is very sensitive. So if that's occurring, then you, know, you need to get it treated. So the causes, you can have structural causes, you can have motor causes, so that means everything's moving through too slowly, and there are other things here. 
You know, one of the things that I'm going to talk briefly about is prolonged use of antacid medication, which I think is, is, it can cause issues, but also previous gastroenteritis and, and you know, people travel all around the world, they get food poisoning, they get gut infections, and that can change the whole system and make it very sensitive going forward. So one of the ways we can look at motility is using um, the smart pill. It's a capsule that you swallow. It looks quite big. It's about as big as the tip of your little finger. So, um, you know, it does take a bit of swallowing. But this measures all of the gut contractions and acidity levels as it goes through the bowel. And we've used it both in, in healthy subjects, patients, and, and in um, pharmaceutical studies. Uh, you get a little box to take home with you, so it's completely wired. Once you've swallowed it, it just remotely talks to the, to the box. And what the trace looks like, um, sorry, this is one of my little joke slides, endorsed at the highest level. I think I took this one we're queuing outside Buckingham Palace and found a smart pill in my pocket and just couldn't resist um, getting the highest level of endorsement for the product. Um, <clears throat> so we can do this in lots of different types of patients, but the most information has been done in people with gastroparesis, which Megan talked about, uh, constipation and IBS subjects. So the protocol is people stop taking their antacid medication so we can see the stomach acid, you have a test meal, um, you swallow the capsule, and then that's it. You just go about your normal business until you um, pass the capsule, usually in one to three days later. And what the, tra uh, what the trace looks like, um, which I'll show you now. So this is a person who's coming to the clinic and is not going to swallow the capsule. They look at the capsule and they go, oh my God, it's huge. So we don't bother with these people, but if they're pretty chilled about it, then you know, they're gonna be fine. So that's the main issue for us is, can you swallow the capsule? But once it's in, the study is, is fine. So the whole study here uh, is what it looks like. Red is pressure, green is acid, blue is temperature. And if you zoom in on this, this is the acidification of the meal in the stomach before it drops into the small bowel and carries on its journey. Um, and this allows you to look at feeding and fed contractions in the stomach. And then this is the journey through the small bowel. You can see the pH rises and then drops as it goes into the large bowel, which I'll talk about a little bit more now. And this is what we were talking about with bacterial fermentation in the colon. This change in pH here, if you didn't eat and didn't have anything in there, there'd be very little change between the small bowel and the large bowel. All of this acidity is caused by the fermentation of food that you've eaten and this is an important clinical factor, as I'll show you, in IBS. And the last thing, how do we know when it's gone? The temperature drops here, patient's gone to the toilet, test is finished. So we know it's a safe uh, measure of colon transit, and we know the capsule's left the body at that point. So we've done lots of normal studies. This is in over 215 normal subjects. So it's a well-validated test. Um, and this is the bit that I want to zoom back in on now, which is this ileo, um, this is small bowel and the large bowel interface here. So what is happening around here that might cause symptoms in IBS? Well, Adam and I did um, a trial, and what we showed is that the pH in the in IBS patients um, is much lower, so around a pH 5 in IBS patients compared to pH 6 in control subjects, and the drop across that interface is much higher in IBS. So that means that IBS patients are creating more products of fermentation, short-chain fatty acids, more fermentation of those FODMAPs. And the pH won't drop below 5 because fermentation stops at pH 5. Okay? So that's why in our patients, when we look at their traces, I always wondered when we did the initial studies, lots and lots of symptoms. The capsule goes into the small bowel. The pH is 5 here, and then you're getting passage of the capsule as it leaves the body here. So this just shows a huge drop in pH across um, the ileocecal junction, and that is purely down to the fermentation of things in the large bowel. And we believe that's what causes a lot of symptoms and symptom benefit in the FODMAP diet. Um, what we also saw in IBS patients is sometimes the pH dropped and went back up again, and this showed the capsule was going back up into the small bowel and you shouldn't really get reflux of contents back from the large bowel to the small bowel, but that's what happens in bacterial overgrowth. So there's two things going on in some IBS patients, overgrowth and excessive fermentation. And we did a 28-day low FODMAP uh, intervention, and we showed we could normalize the pH in the colon in a proportion of those patients. So we think that's due to changes when you reduce the FODMAPs, you change the microbiota in the colon, and because the test meal was the same in both um, studies, 
then the change in pH was due to a change in the microbiota that was induced by the low FODMAP diet. And we're hoping to follow that up. And I know Megan's doing similar studies at King's. So um, there were just two examples of the test that we've done and the validation we've gone through and, uh, uh, you know, to try and make sure they're the best we can. Um, we know that the smart pill is a safe and effective tool and it provides us with uh, insights into it, actually what's going on in each patient and an individual patient rather than just trying to take a generic uh, approach to it. And it gives us some objective biomarkers. So are people more constipated? Are they more acidic? Have they got a problem in the stomach? Is it a panintestinal problem? And that helps guide treatment used in conjunction with other tests and can help to assess the efficacy of, of treatment either to, to drugs as we've done or to dietary interventions. So it's a very useful tool. So future develops, just a few slides now just to finish off because some of these things have cropped up in your conversation. What else are we doing to try and push the boundaries and, and come up with more diagnostic tests? Well, there's this um, microbial hypothesis um, where some people get an gastroenteritis um, they develop a toxin during that gastroenteritis and that causes a level of autoimmunity in the gut uh, which can slow down gut transit and allow you to get bacterial overgrowth. Um, this has been validated in the States and we've done a clinical trial here where we found similar studies that in a proportion of patients who developed IBS symptoms after they had a gut infection, they have positive antibodies for this and that can be done with a test called IBS check. Uh, it's a blood test that's simply done. Having a negative IBS check doesn't mean you don't have IBS, but it helps to put an organic reason for why you developed IBS in the first place, especially if you can tailor it to when you were away in Vietnam or something like that. And you know what Adam and I have found is that patients who are positive for this it tends to be a little bit more tricky and requires a bit more lengthier treatment to get them back to normal. Um, I think we'd, we'd agree. Um, so for people who've got pelvic floor and evacuation issues, we're now using neuromodulation with a magnetic chair that actually stimulates the, the muscles of the pelvic floor to either strengthen or sometimes relax them to help them as a kind of therapy um, to make evacuation more. Um, you know, this is in the constipated type patients. Um, we're also looking at long-term acid suppression. So if you've got reflux and you've taken PPIs, the acid in your stomach is there for a reason to kill the bugs. If you take it away, then more bugs will get through, you're more likely to get overgrowth. And these are patients who've still got symptoms on long-term PPI, uh, there's 117 of them, and about 70% of them have an abnormal breath tests. It's a big proportion. But normally these people get more and more acid suppression drugs and sometimes get referred to surgeons for surgery, when actually what they need to do is have a different treatment uh, and hopefully get off their PPIs and then try and normalize their stomach and digestive processes. Megan talked about low iron. Iron supplements are very common. 1.7 million people across the UK are taking iron supplements. 70% of them get gut symptoms. And we think that's because the iron acts as a fuel for methane producing bacteria, which cause bloating and constipation. And so we're looking at methods now where we can try and interfere with that process uh, and try and improve things. So lots and lots of things are going on. The stool testing, we're partnering with a company now that's based in Spain, who look at the diversity of your microbiome and what we're trying to do is, again, set up a small trial to look at the information that provides and then see whether the interventions that Adam uh, and Megan and the other dietitians use can manipulate that increased diversity um, uh, in some patients and whether that has any clinical benefit. Until we do this, we don't know whether stool testing is useful or not, but I think we're with the right partners now doing the most sophisticated way of doing it. Um, and the leaky gut, there's just been a paper recently in people who've got post-infectious IBS where they've used an assay looking at urine collection where you can um, basically take urine collections for six hours after you've had a sugar solution. And what we want to do is to do a, a more of a randomized trial to try and prove whether these leaky gut assays are actually useful in IBS per se or just in those patients who've got post-infectious IBS, which it seems to be the issue at the moment. So I think the most important thing to finish off with is that we don't work in isolation. This concept of a digestive health multidisciplinary team, you know, it involves predominantly being a gastroenterologist-led service, uh, but it involves the input of, of ourselves as clinical scientists, dietetics, psychologists, pelvic floor physios, radiologists if we need imaging, and more and more urogynecology in people with pelvic floor issues uh, and evacuation issues. So we don't work in isolation. We have these teams in place both here in Manchester, um, and it's really important that we cross-fertilise because we all complement each other with our, our different aspects of knowledge. So thank you very much for your time.